Um, the real reason you're here is to hear about Missouri River Art Adventures. Um, and this is going to be an absolute blast. So our presenter tonight, Steve Snell, is a professor at the Kansas City Art Institute. And I first met Steve quite a few years ago. We used to host the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in Columbia. And he reached out to us to say that his um, his students have, have been putting together every year. And I, do you guys still do the Brush Creek? Yeah. So every year, his students put together something called the Brush Creek Film Festival, where they go out in the Brush Creek area, downtown Kansas City, um, you know, near the plaza, right? The, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, and come up with stories and they just come up with the coolest stuff. And so we like made that part of Wild and Scenic for a couple of years and just brought like a couple of highlights of those films, which is really fun. Um, and then he reached out to us a few years ago to let us know that he was gonna be doing this amazing adventure down the Missouri River. So um, he'll tell you all the details, but along the way, he painted paintings, um, multiple paintings a day. Um, and hopefully he'll tell us how we can see some of those, but you can definitely check out his website, which is linked to from the Big Money Speaker Series website to find out more. He'll, sh he'll share that with you. Um, I had the really great luck of running into Steve on his, the day before his last day on the Missouri River, we were um, doing safety boats for a canoe race near St. Louis and motoring back and we just see this little straw hat in the distance and um sure enough it's steve and so slow down you know go up to him and it was just like it was just the coolest thing to see steve in, in his shining glory all by himself paddling 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 after months of paddling down the entire missouri river knowing that he was just about to finish this amazing journey with like no fanfare you know no crowds um but these two amazing people in the back, we're gonna go meet them in St. Louis. Uh, so that, that was just a sweet, beautiful moment. Um, and I'm just so stoked that Steve was able to join us tonight to share some of his story and, and, and really the whole big picture of this art project that he did around um, this trip, which is really cool. It's, it's like a treasure forever for, for people. And thank you for doing it, sharing it. And thank you for coming tonight, Steve. Thank you, Steve, and hopefully I'm on a lavalier. It sounds like it works. Yep. So thank you all for coming tonight uh, to, to hear my story or at least a little bit about it. I plan to talk for about 25 minutes or so, and then we'll end by watching um, a full episode of this project I'm currently working on, which is um, basically a painting show that takes place on the Missouri River. So you'll be the first actually to see this outside of my wife and my parents. So I hope you like it. <laughs> I, um, I just want to thank uh, Missouri River Relief for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight, as well as um, I wanted to thank the Mid-America Arts Alliance and the National Endowment for the Arts, which helped sponsor this project uh, financially. And then the Kansas City Art Institute, which graciously awarded me a sabbatical last fall, which allowed me to actually to do this trip right now in my life. Probably the biggest support though, goes to my wife, Elizabeth and my son who, held it down in Kansas City while I was gone and mailed me my food along the way and uh, as well as more watercolor paper uh, and all the, the, the supplies I needed. I also wanted to acknowledge the, uh, the various tribes of which I, the lands I traveled uh, through their historic lands. Um, but today where we are from my research, um, we're on the lands of the Osage, the Missouri, Peoria, Kaskia, Sioux, Sock and Fox, and Kickapoo. And uh, I think just acknowledging that history of displacement um, is important, but also for me being on the river, like there's times when you're all alone for like a week at a time and you kind of get this feeling like, this is my river, I'm, I have it to myself. But it was always an important reminder for me to be like, no, I'm, I'm a guest here. There's many people that have come before me and I'm just so lucky to be able to appreciate it at this time and place where I am. And so I wanted to uh, acknowledge that before talking a little bit about my story, which is adventure art on the mighty Mo. 
Imagine a painting show that takes place on the entirety of the Missouri River, kind of like a cross between an adventure survival show and the joy of painting with Bob Ross. That's that was kind of the concept that I went into uh, for this, and I'm I'm still in the midst of editing, and I'll just qualify everything I show as a work in progress. But I'll I'll just start by maybe showing the intro sequence uh, to give you a little bit of idea of where this is going. My name is Steve Snell, and welcome to Adventure Art on the Mighty Mo, a painting show about paddling the entire Missouri River. Over the course of three months, I will paddle over 2,300 miles. I will live in a tent. I will look for adventure. I will paint a lot of paintings. This is Adventure Art on the Mighty Mo. Uh, so we'll, we'll try and get the audio figured out. I guess there's a little bit of distortion, but um, that's kind of the concept there. And where does it come from, the idea of adventure art? It's actually something I've been, I've been kind of doing for, I guess, over a decade now. And um, started in 2010 with the, the building of my first boat, which just happened to be in the shape of a couch. And... <laughs> I, I built this, I was in graduate school at the University of Massachusetts. And I actually made this over the summertime just for the heck of it. It wasn't supposed to be art. It was, I called it summer art at the time, like art that I just could have fun with. And I happened to love floating in ponds and lakes and rivers. And so I just started building this couch boat and um, I started to plan to go down about 10 miles of the Connecticut River, which went through, through the area. And uh, I had mapped out about 10 miles where nobody would see me because I, I was so conscious of like, you know, being seen in a couch boat. And I had the, a really, really important conversation with a faculty member um, that he challenged me to actually take on the 10 miles where I would be seen. And, you know, where all the pontoon boats and kayakers and canoers might be present. Uh, my background is in painting. And a lot of the paintings I had been making and videos I had been making for years were kind of around this, this myth and of, of the hero and the hero's journey and uh, often kind of placed in like the American kind of uh, West or I'm thinking Davy Crockett, uh, her heroes like that. And um, so he challenged me to, to maybe insert my own character of sorts and to popular media and just see what happens. So I wrote a press release. I called it adventure art because I didn't really know what to call it. And like the news showed up and uh, <laughs> And I still don't know what it means or like, you know, they, I called myself King of the River. They called me King of the River. It became this like self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. But what it, what it did kind of teach me uh, at that time, and this was going into my last year of school, was that like my artwork and my life don't have to be like separate from each other. That I can create art that can create for myself or for others like meaningful life experiences. And in this case, like I... I Genuinely, I'm looking for an adventure in the sense of like taking an on, on an unknown, risking failure, um, just hopefully, you know, coming out alive. And I don't want to like risk risk life or anything, but I think risking failure and not really knowing where you're going in terms of the final outcome is always an important element for me. And I won't go into to everything I've done since, but uh, I'd say like that ultimately did lead me to the Missouri River. Um, in 2015, I took a job at the Kansas City Art Institute, and I was previously living in central Nebraska, and I spent that summer in Nebraska City, uh, where my wife was working at the time, which was my first encounter with the Missouri River, and like as soon as I saw it, it just kind of struck me as like, okay, that's, that's what I need to do, like I, I, for an adventure, I'm moving to Kansas City, I'm going to be living on the lo longest river in North America, there's so much history here uh, to pull from with you know, Lewis and Clark being kind of like the first entry point for me. Um, and so I didn't overthink it, but I just started thinking of this dream of uh, building a cardboard replica of Lewis and Clark's keel boat and floating it from Nebraska City to Kansas City. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's where it started. Uh, it turned out to be a lot more difficult and dangerous than I originally thought. Um, but I spent two full summers building that boat ultimately just 
ending up buying a kayak off of Craigslist and, uh, and floated the river from Nebraska City to Kansas City the following summer um, for seven days and nights and uh, making watercolor paintings along the way. Uh, it was I'd, in many ways kind of like uh, set for me like a template for what I did this past summer in terms of uh, what I could be doing while I'm on the river, but also uh, just kind of instilled for me like a love of the river and wanting to go back. I should say like while I was dreaming up this cardboard boat idea, I went for a run one day and um, went down to the boat ramp and that's where I, I saw a through kayaker for the first time. I saw a guy loading up his boat with all this gear and I just asked him where he was going and he told me the Gulf. And I was like, I didn't know people did that. Yeah. And he's like, sure. And he, he told me about uh, the Missouri River Paddlers Facebook group and uh, all the, the resource of information that's really out there online in the community that already exists. And so tapping into that and just really instilled with me this, this larger dream of one day doing more. That, uh, his name was Alan Palmer. Wow. Yeah, so if Alan's ever watching this. Thanks, Alan. He also gave me some feedback about my cardboard boat idea because uh, he was telling me what he was doing. I'm like, I have this idea about a cardboard boat. What do you think? Um, he didn't shoot it down, which I appreciate. He just told me to go to the middle of the river. That's where it'd be safest. And so I, you know, I feel like a, a big part of this again is risk and failure, and and still, despite like those challenges, like you know, I, I built a first iteration of the boat that was not very good, and then I spent another summer building this, this version, which I really intended to actually float the river. It's completely waterproof. It's all cardboard, uh, like triple ply TV boxes, you know, that I cut together like a three-dimensional puzzle. And then I sealed it with a, a marine epoxy resin. The rudder even like turns on a, on a hinge made it all of cardboard. But, um, you know, unfortunately, even with an epoxy resin, it just takes like one little like poke uh, and you've got like a sponge and uh, anyway, I still did it, you know, I did it in the, in the kayak, but the part of adventure art is just the shaping of the image of adventure in the studio. I could use a green screen and create a video that at least created that idealized vision of adventure that I, I really wanted. And like ultimately probably came up with like a much better image than if I had done it on my own. I mean, I think it would have floated for a little bit until I had to get rescued. But um, so the, the final piece that came out of this was a larger installation of the, the boat. And then this about 10 minute video that just shows this kind of bearded wilderness wanderer making his way through uh, about 200 miles of river, all set to some nice river music that my friend Mark made. And it just becomes a portrait of the river really. These are some of the paintings I made on that journey. And so all the landscapes were painted on site with river water and then in the studio I would start to paint artifacts of the things that I saw or collected or ate um, in the case of like snacks <laughs> so hey, look at this body of work I thought was kind of like an autobiographical uh, document of those those seven days and uh, it was the first time really honestly that I think I've ever done like plein air landscape painting and I really only do this kind of painting when I'm on the river it just it really suits the lifestyle, I guess, of, of paddling and, and camping. And um, it's, I can talk a little bit more, but uh, as I go forward, but it's a really way of being present, I find, and just appreciating the place where I am at the time that I'm there. Uh, this is actually the boat in the water. So after the art show, I finally did invite the, you know, the Kansas City community to come see me put it to the test. And you can see, I, I put these giant kind of oars that were salvaged from like crew I guess I don't know what they're called and uh, I made them look like cardboard but they're they're actually fiberglass and so that's the only way I could make it so I didn't tip over this thing was so tippy that uh, like the slightest breeze would push you over and then of course by the time I got to the Missouri this is on the Kansas River this is near Cop Point if you're familiar with the Kansas City waterfront you know it was like 30 mile an hour winds and white caps and I just barely crossed over the line so here I am, um, you know, 2023, well, the summer of 2022, with this idea of floating the entire Missouri River in a canoe and painting all along the way and shooting video for this like video series idea that I have. 
And I have multiple inspirations, um, but for in terms of watercolor, it starts with the work of Carl Bodmer, who is a Swiss artist that went up the river in 18, I think 31. He was kind of like the documentarian for a German prince explorer named Prince Maximilian von Wied. And, uh, you know, coming about 30 years after Lewis and Clark, his watercolors really, I feel like they're like an important document of what the river looks like, you know, prior to uh, the modernization and the, and the damming that took place over the last, you know, 100 years. I mean, the Bijou Hills in South Dakota still actually look quite a bit like that, um, with the exception of the sandbar in the, in the foreground, uh, but now it's Francis Case Lake. When I moved to Kansas City, learning about the work of George Caleb Bingham, and he's buried just down the road from where I live, and uh, his, his river paintings from the 19th century are some of my favorites as well. I know St. Louis has a, has a large collection as well as Kansas City has some. But uh, living on the river, like his color palette is remarkably similar or familiar, I should say. <laughs> Painting is really a way to tell stories. That's at least the way I, I'm seeing this, this video series. Like I would set up occasionally and try and be my inner Bob Ross, but uh, it was really for me, it's not so much an instructional painting series as much as a uh, a portrait of the river or an opportunity for me to tell stories through the act of painting. But hopefully you do learn something about painting or composition as well. And uh, finally, I'm not, I actually don't watch a whole lot of uh, current television, but I did watch a little bit of this, this reality show before leaving, not so much for like living on the river as much as like trying to figure out how are they actually recording these uh, through GoPros, through drones, Etc. I'm kind of like a one person production crew. And uh, I was just like another part of life on the river was not like as much paddling and eating as and camping as much as like, all right, painting and then also capturing the image of painting. So on June 2nd, my support crew drove with me up to uh, Montana. Uh, this is the boat ramp up at Three Forks. And uh, I'll just step away. Hopefully the audio will be a little clearer this time. Turn my output down. Okay, I'll turn that down. And uh, this is just, uh, I'd say, like three minutes of the very beginning of episode one. The adventure begins on June 2nd at the headwaters of the Missouri River in Three Forks, Montana. This is the confluence of the Jefferson, Madison, and Gallatin Rivers and where the Missouri officially starts. From here, I will paddle over 2,300 miles through seven states, across nine lakes, and around 15 dams to the confluence of the Mississippi River in St. Louis, Missouri. The Missouri is the longest river in North America. It is both wild and heavily managed by the Army Corps of Engineers for navigation, recreation, hydroelectricity, and flood control purposes. There is no simple description for this river as it changes significantly as it makes its way across the middle half of the United States. It is not the most popular river to paddle, but that is part of the appeal. One can pretty much have it to themselves for days at a time and achieve a feeling of being truly alone, even when paddling by a city of over a million people. It is full of history and there are plenty of unknowns. It is well suited for adventure and art making. It will not be easy, but I'm pretty sure I can do it. Love you guys too. Looks wrong way. Bye. Bye. Love you too. All right. I think it's working. I'll see you in St. Louis or Kansas City. As I set off from the boat ramp in Three Forks, Montana, 
I try not to think too much about the distance and time it will take to get home, which is about three months. I am not an expert paddler, but I do take precautions, prepare ahead of time, and know what I am doing to some degree. I have spent the past several months dehydrating food, gathering supplies, and figuring out a plan. While true adventure always contains an unknown element of risk and potential failure, I am determined to complete this journey safely and successfully. My background is in art. I have been undertaking adventures in search of it for over a decade now, and my first boat was that of a couch. I also have a cardboard replica of Lewis and Clark's keelboat and dream one day about floating a giant pretzel across the state of Missouri. As many artists have and do, I look to the river for creative inspiration. While this is my most ambitious adventure yet, I figure I will learn a lot about paddling as I go, and there's plenty of time and miles ahead to get to know my boat. My boat is a 16 and a half foot solo canoe with a custom cover and foot controlled rudder system. I recently purchased it off of the Craigslist classifieds and had just enough time to test it out once on the river before heading up north to Montana. It is a great boat. I'm able to carry up to a week's worth of water, a month's supply of food, and 60 sheets of watercolor paper at any one time. Mississippi at St. Louis. So um, wing dikes every I think, quarter mile or so and a, and a pretty good current to, to push you along. So I'll just uh, maybe show a few pictures alongside some of my paintings to like describe what that actually looks like. This is Tostin Dam. You'll reach that within day one after three forks. It just takes maybe a four or five hours to get to your, your first portage of uh, moving your, your supply around, around the dam. Um, maybe a quarter mile or so where there's a nice little campground. And that's where I made my first painting. Um, just seeing what the, the landscape looks like here. I think like some of my favorite parts of the river are located in the upper, upper Missouri. And that was some of the advice that I was given prior to my journey was like, take your time in Montana. Uh, there, don't, don't be in a rush. And so I really wasn't, I'd say like painting was my priority at this time. I'd, wake up when the sun rose and make some coffee and make a painting and then get in my boat. And uh, just some of my favorite camping was along this, this, this reach. This is the gates of the mountains, part of, I think, Helena National Forest. And um, just pretty, just epic, epic landscapes to paddle through on like a pretty much daily basis. Yeah, it's also the, the section where the Upper Missouri Breaks National Monument is located. So if you ever get a chance to go up to uh, Montana and float this section of river, I would highly recommend it. There's plenty of guided outfits that will, um, you know, help you out with that or even like portage your, your car for you. Um, you can pay to, to have it meet you at the end. And that's... Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the breaks because the episode that I'll show at the end actually takes place here, but it's also one of my favorites. Sorry, I'll keep scooting over to be on the camera. So the dammed upper Missouri, like I mentioned, six pretty large lakes, the first of which is Fort Peck. I can't remember how many miles it is, but I know they say there's more coastline than the entire state of California. Um, 
Of course, you don't have to paddle all that coastline if you're willing to make those open water crossings. And that's where it can be kind of dangerous. So just always keeping an eye on the weather, especially the wind, and just kind of being smart about when to paddle. So it was when I hit Fort Peck that my priorities kind of inverted from painting first, paddling later, to always like paddling first, and then paint when I can. And so I got really lucky on Fort Peck and had four days of like calm winds and sunshine. So I pretty much paddled straight through um, in four and a half days and made a, a little bit of time to paint at the end of the day. And this is what it looks like on, on the opening end facing the UL bend. So on its smaller side, and um, it just kind of continually gets bigger and bigger as you, as you reach the dam. And most of my painting would either take place at the end of the day at this point, or like in this case, getting blown ashore by winds that were too much to feel safe in your boat. And so <laughs> I would just take a four hour or five hour hiatus or however long until the winds cut out so I could safely paddle again. I mean, this is a, a Army Corps photo of what the dam looks like. And I can't remember how big it is, but these are just massive earthwork dams that were, in this case, built in the 1930s under the Works Progress Administration. Just going to kind of skip through some of these photos just to give you um, an idea, though, of what some of these uh, places look like. Lake Sakakawea is from basically a little bit outside of Williston, North Dakota, is where it begins to um, well north of Fargo, North Dakota, by some by some miles. Lake Oahe is the largest of the lakes. It starts in North Dakota and you cross you cross into South Dakota to it ends near Pierre. This day, I recall, this is near Mobridge, was like 50 mile an hour winds. And I just got lucky. I could I could uh, usually see what the forecast was coming and I would try and plan my my paddling accordingly. So I remember waking up at like four in the morning the day before the high end winds were expected and just barely made it into Mobridge before it really started kicking. And then had a nice break at Bridge City Marina where uh, the, the Norders took me in and fed me. And um, I got a chance to climb up a bit and make some paintings. But I just remember like the wind would like blow this out of my hands. It was going so fast. But those are also some of my favorite paintings I found was when I had less control, uh, whether it was because of the wind or the rain or the mosquitoes. Uh, like oh, if I was really comfortable and I had all the time, like those are usually some of the least interesting paintings I feel like I made. <laughs> And, you know, in this case, again, like being windbound on Oahe, I mean, it was, I just felt so lucky that I found some trees. There was not a lot of trees on this lake, or at least where I was paddling, and uh, found this nice little grove of cottonwoods. And, um, you know, just try to soak it all up. Like, don't, the advice I also was given was like, don't try and stick to a strict schedule. Just em embrace the moment and do what the, the lake or the river or the wind will allow. And, I remember when the wind did cut out, I was almost sad because I was enjoying <laughs> where I was and I hadn't had a break for a few days until then. And talking about breaks, I, I, I found that like painting was a really nice compliment for me to paddling. Like I didn't really look at my numbers in terms of how far have I gone? How much farther do I have to go? I, I would, you know, see on my GPS how far I went that day. And that was kind of a cool thing to see. But um, just kind of bite-sized chunks was healthy for me mentally, I think, than thinking about what, what like really lied ahead. But I always found that like if I went more than three days without painting, my morale would really dip. And that's when I would be questioning like, why am I, why am I doing this? I mean, I love paddling, but uh, I was kind of on this mission to paint. And so three days was kind of my limit before I would, all right, let's just stop and take some time and try and enjoy uh, the day. So I'll just kind of flip through some of these other images. Uh, these are all kind of chronological of the river from, from west to east, north to south. So this is after Lake Francis Case, but before Lake Lewis and Clark. The lowest, uh, lower Missouri River, barges, uh, commercial traffic, uh, a much faster current, plenty of you know, grain silos and and cool kind of concrete looking castle buildings that I love seeing the history and like, and, and I feel like you can really 
not just see like the economic history, but recent flood history on um, some of these ab abandoned buildings, but also where some of my favorite camping and sandbars are actually like really close to where we are right now is uh, just football size fields plus like multiple football size field islands of sand. And uh, it's just, again, one of my favorite, favorite places to be. People asked me while I was on my trip, like, oh, are you painting from the boat? And no would be my answer typically. Like I, it didn't seem very feasible, especially um, on the upper Missouri River. On the lakes, if you're not paddling, you're not going anywhere. And um, if the wind's blowing, you might be going backwards. But when you're on the lower Missouri, I actually, I found it to work really well for me. Um, I have a rudder so I could control where I was steering with my feet and you can sit in your boat and kind of go at three miles per hour. So when I was bored or just needed to do something other than paddle, I found that like painting from the boat uh, was a good way to kind of solve that problem. And it, it was also an interesting problem to solve because the landscape's actually moving past you. So these become kind of composites of what I passed. I never felt in danger. I thought it would be irresponsible at first, but uh, actually the way I paint all these, it's like very much about looking. Like I'm not looking at the, the page. And if I am, I'm kind of cheating. Like I would remind myself, like you need to like be trying to translate what you see. So I'd always see what's coming. The most dangerous thing actually on the boat to do would be on your phone, which is how I would be checking my maps because it's all through Garmin's like little thing. And so you have to have the app to see your map. And then before you know it, you're like, oh shoot, like you just get sucked right in. But painting in the boat was a great way to know it's coming. Here are some other places that might be familiar if you've paddled around, around this part of the river. Like this is like literally just past the bridges. Yeah, Wilson Serenity Point down at uh, Jeff City. And then uh, that was the last, second to last painting I made on the river. Actually, that's the confluence with the Mississippi. And all, I think, you know, my goal was 200. I was like, I'm gonna make at least 200 paintings. I think I made 90, uh, <laughs> which was almost one a day. Oh, it was about one a day. I was on the river for 88 days. Um, but sometimes I would make like three or four in a day and then other times I wouldn't make any. And then I, I painted about 30 smaller postcard size paintings that I would mail out to people that supported me. Um, I did a Kickstarter campaign. And so I would mail out paintings to those backers or leave them with river angels that helped me out along the way. The setup was pretty, uh, pretty minimal, pretty basic. Uh, it was like, wherever I landed was really where I would paint. Like I would try and hit some key places that seemed important to me, like confluences of different rivers, or I wanted to be sure to make a painting at, at each of the lakes um, and each of the, the different reaches of the river, like the Missouri Breaks or Gates of the Mountains. But this is a more typical kind of setup of somewhere between Fort Peck Lake and Sakakawea in Eastern Montana, where, you know, it's just a sandbar where I was able to get some sleep and make a painting before the sunset. Sometimes, you know, they have those beautiful colors and this is a, the last night in Montana, I recall. So it's just a day's paddle to Williston, North Dakota from here. And um, it was beautiful sunset. It was just so, so amazing, but um, actually it was one of the most miserable paintings to make. I just recall like the mosquitoes really emerged here for me. And that whole area, which is surrounded by mud flats, they're just, they're really pretty bad. And apparently they were really bad in Lewis and Clark's time too. Uh, I got out of my boat at the confluence with the Yellowstone and they were like on me like that. I, I was only there for 10 minutes and then they like, it took me another 30 minutes to get rid of them from my boat. <clears throat> they don't follow you in your boat. They did. Yeah, but... yeah, these ones did. I mean, I had like 20 like join me from my boat and then I'm trying to like get rid of them until I could uh, get them all gone. But this is like Sakakawea, the confluence with the uh, Platte River. 
So this is south of Omaha, north of uh, Nebraska City. And uh, that's, you know, like you're looking at like the setup for both making a painting and then, you know, shooting quote unquote an episode. And so every so many days or weeks, like when I was at a certain site, I'd be like, okay, like it's not just about making a painting. Like I need to shoot an episode, which means get out the nice camera, set up one of these like little lavalier kind of microphones and uh, sit down and talk while I paint, which was just like a whole nother level of uh, work on my end, I felt like. And I've always felt like at the end, I'm like, those are sometimes my, like my worst paintings, I feel like, because I'm, I'm just trying to do it all. But uh, I'm, I'm working with what I have. And uh, it was just another part of the process. I, yeah, there was a question, did I have a drone as well? Yes. And so that's that's like where this kind of shot would come from as well. So whenever I shot an episode or if I was at like a feature like the confluence with the Yellowstone, I'd get the drone out and fly that up to try and get a bird's eye view of what was going on. This is not too far from here. This is in, uh, on an island. Jericho told me it's called Hot Dog Island, but I think that's a really informal name. It's, uh, it's just where the confluence with the Osage River is. So if you know that island that like is right past that, he said people cooked out hot dogs during the MR340 there, I think. So maybe, maybe that's where it got its name. Um, and then I just, I wanna just briefly mention another whole element of this project, which I didn't anticipate the impact it would have on me personally, but it was like the people that I met all along the way. Uh, I mean, day one till the end, this was the Missouri River Rendezvous, uh, some of which are here in the audience today and uh, <laughs> multiple. Um, but really, day one, this is just below Tossin Dam. I met a guy named Pot Roast Jack that, you know, <laughs> invited me in for pot roast and, and a beer. And that really, like, was just more, more common than not. And some, some people I was aware of before I got there, you know, like um, Robin uh, Kaltop and Norm Miller from the Missouri River Paddlers group shared a, a list of names of people like Jim that you know, are there to help you get a ride around the dams. So this is Canyon Ferry. But so many people, too, that you just don't anticipate meeting. Dave, Dave Hillman was another through paddler that year, and he caught up to me on, I think, day four or five. And we leapfrogged along for like the next two months. Um, so too many people to really mention by name right now and still have time to show the video. But I just want to at least share their picture because uh, they mean a lot to me and everything that they provided was just so kind and so generous in a way that like this is a good reminder of the goodness of people I remember and I just do because I I'm watching all this footage right now of like me talking to a GoPro in my canoe and I, I think one of my early fears was just running into sketchy people and I never met anybody that was sketchy the entire time. I uh, I met hey, David. Um, I met I met just good people from beginning to end. What is that? I'll let David answer that. Uh, that's that's his. Post. This is. That's that's just a sunshade for paddling on the river up there in the rendezvous in July. And uh, last person I met on the river, as Steve mentioned, was Steve <laughs> Schnarr. So this is just outside of Chesterfield, Missouri. And I, I think I camped just like maybe a quarter mile past this point on this beautiful sandy island. And uh, it was just, it was a great way to, to really end, um, end my 88 day journey. I had plans to, to make it to the arch. I just thought it'd be this epic kind of beautiful finishing line. And of course, like as I'm getting close, this is near the chain of rocks on the Mississippi uh, where you have to portage around. Like I could just see like the thunderheads rolling in. And uh, it was, I guess, maybe a better way to end, like having gone through multiple thunderstorms at this point. And, you know, honestly, besides I'd say thunderstorms and cows were like my biggest concern. Um, it was a great way to, to end the trip and having my support crew there to come pick me up. Um, it was couldn't ask for really anything more. So I hopefully I do have time. Um, I always wanted to show you like 
the full episode of this is actually episode three. So we're going to skip ahead in time a little bit from the last one I showed you. Uh, it'll take you through half of the Missouri breaks and um, it's a draft, but it's pretty close, I think, to where this to where this show's going. And I, I've mapped out a total of 12 episodes in total at this point. And um, my like my goal was to start premiering them this spring and get them online. I'm hopeful but it, it might be closer to fall. I'm just finding the editing to take a lot more time than, than the paddling, but uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I believe. I'll, I'll go ahead and press play and hopefully the audio will be loud enough. I need to change something, just let me know. Previously on the Mighty Mo, I depart the Missouri River headwaters on June 2nd in search of adventure and art. Morale remains high despite my fear of a nearby fugitive. I meet a puppy that will later be named Steve and become windbound on Upper Lake Hauser. I make it to the gates of the mountains wilderness and take the time to paint. Welcome to Bighorn, primitive camp on the Upper Missouri Breaks National Monument. Here in the Badlands section, it's day like four, I think, going through the National Monument. The first day was beautiful. The second and the third days were pretty intense. Get off the water. I'm getting off the water. I use most of these two big brushes, big round one and a big flat one. I use the flat one to like put in big washes for like skies or for water but I mostly really just use this brush. What I like about it is that it helps put down quite a bit of color. I have a little bit of control, but not too much. Because what I found with this painting is that the more I try and control, the more I try and make this look like a photograph, the less interesting it is. It's not a photograph. It's a painting. And what it is, is a record of this time, this place, and this moment, and my perception of it. And I'm just trying to perceive it and capture that as honestly as I can. And that means looking and not making stuff up, just looking at the page, but really trying to look and correspond to this mark to that paper based off of what I see. And by doing that, it inherently becomes abstract. And sometimes you get lucky. Oh, something just bit me. That little fly. Ow. The heck? I didn't do anything. Oh, so let's go back in time a little bit. It was a peaceful morning as I depart my idyllic canyon camp in the gates of the mountains wilderness. I paddle for the good part of a day and soon reach another lake. Ultra Lake is comparatively small when compared with the others, but as with any lake on the mighty Mung, there is a dam that must be portaged. Portagings. One of my least favorite things to do. I do what must be done and make camp at a popular fishing access point below the dam. It is an opportunity to make another painting. 
This section of river is known for its blue ribbon trout fishing. Drift boats abound with folks fly fishing and I am careful to stay out of their way. There is clear, fast, shallow, and firm. Rapids are numerous, and I must pay attention to stay open. I am making my way out of the mountains and soon find myself in a high plateau defined by farms and ranches. The Missouri River flows north for the first couple hundred miles and even heads west for a bit of this section, forcing me even farther away from home in order to eventually float my way back. I'm now about a week into my journey and life on the river is becoming more and more routine. Good night. So I'm getting packed up here. Got a camp all broken down. I flip over my canoe, put it in the water. And I notice here at the bow, it looks to be like a little nest. I was like, I don't remember that. And I broke it up at this point. What rolls out? Another stowaway. I got to get this guy somehow. He's in here. There he is. Poor guy. Here. You're just scared. It's okay. Hold on. Hold on. Maybe a paddle. Go ahead and climb on. Go ahead. You got it. You got it. Yep. Oh, you had it. You got it. You got it. It's a little slippery. Oh, man. Here we go. Nope. Last time, this one should be a little easier. Here you go. Got up. He's a big, big girl or boy. I don't know. You can get your fill. Here we go. Wow. All right, I'm putting on the camera for this. Well, about half hour, 45 minutes later, I'm finally leaving the island. I soon reach the city of Great Falls and take advantage of hotel proximity to the portage takeout for a much needed shower, bath, second shower, and pizza. But it just felt good to have a night's sleep without the coyotes waking me up or the beavers. However, the river calls, and the following day I catch a ride around the local five dams by River Angels Jim and Phyllis. They are kind river people. They have been foraging fellow paddlers for decades, and I am grateful for their help and advice. <laughs> It is a short paddle from the put-in at Carter's Ferry to Fort Bend, a historic river town that was once a fur trading post and the end of the line for steamboat traffic. It later became an army garrison and hangout for cowboys, outlaws, cattle rustlers, miners, gamblers, corrupt sheriffs, and people just making their way toward Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. It was apparently a very dangerous place at the time, with criminal murder and vigilante justice a relatively common affair. Now, it has small town river charm, and there are free yellow bikes provided by the local Lions Club for visitors. The canoe camp is only a quick bike ride away from town, and I take a day to explore, rest, and paint. Ahead lies the Upper Missouri Breaks National Monument, a wild and remote badlands area, almost 600 square miles in size, that is administered by the Bureau of Land Management. Here, extraordinary geological formations define a landscape that can feel almost otherworldly at times. There is much history here and you can feel it. All right, so I'm uh, taking just a little bit of a break here in this coulee and white cliffs. I'm gonna try and make a watercolor painting. Despite the wind, 
But hey, this is adventure art, right? Watch out for rattlesnakes. That's probably a rattlesnake ball. Um, it's spectacular. And ready. Oh, oh, rattlesnakes. View of the White Cliffs, or view of the Missouri River from the White Cliffs. Of course, I can go a little bit more, but um, I think this is done. It's done. All right. Trying to leave this little coolie here in the White Cliffs. Stay my painting, get back on the river. So I'm gonna keep rolling through the White Cliffs. Got a number of other stoppings today, I think. While Lewis and Clark were the first white people to jump in it in their journeys, the native tribes long fished, hunted, and lived here. Specifically, the Blackfoot, Northern Cheyenne, Sioux, Assiniboine, Grovant, Crow, Plains Cree, and Plains Ojibwa. The native peoples were eventually removed by the U.S. government, and their land was parceled out and settled through the various congressional homestead acts. However, the desert-like environment did not encourage many of the new immigrants to stay, and most agricultural operations didn't last. Cows are still here, though, and the Upper Missouri Breaks remains open to livestock grazing. There is no motorized boat traffic or cell phone service in this area, and anything brought in must be carried out, including one's poop. This is one of the most popular stretches of the river to paddle, and the BLM does what it can to maintain its natural beauty and character. Thank you, Pop. I haven't really painted much in the rain, but hey, this is adventure art. You got to paint whatever the conditions uh, present. Strip of green. Gosh. All right, well, I finished this painting and I better try and protect it before it gets any more uh, weatherized, but I think it's pretty neat. Oh man, pretty cool. I'll take my finger. This part's already kind of, kind of indistinguishing what's a uh, river here and what's not, but it'll paint, right? Back on the river, just leaving Eagle Creek Campground, finishing my second painting. I have come to the Missouri Breaks and specifically the White Cliffs area with an agenda to paint. I have a romantic vision of painting some of the same formations that were famously documented in watercolor by the Swiss artist Karl Bodmer, who accompanied a German prince up the river in 1833. Coming some 30 years after the Lewis and Clark expedition, Bodmer's paintings depict a river without dams, reservoirs, wing dikes, and riprap. They show native peoples and their traditional way of life while on the verge of change and displacement. These works remain an important artifact of how life on the river was and serve as a major inspiration for my own river painting. Some of the most well-known of these images depict the Missouri breaks. However, I quickly learned that whatever my plans may be, 
the weather, and particularly the wind, will ultimately determine what I can and cannot do. I don't know if that's ever, uh, well, wind is tough. The rain, like, stinks down fast. I got a good ball of my uh, strength to keep the boat straight. Not get pushed to the side. Not much. Right ahead of Signal Rock. Like for a lot of painting. So the fight all that is still pretty cool. As long as I don't fall in. Get off the water. You know. I can. I can off the water. I'm going to tell crazy. Just whipped around like right there in the middle of the water and just disappeared. And then I got hit with that blast. And uh, I don't know what's in the middle of that. Behind me, you see Signal Rock. At least I think that's what it's called, which is in a Carl Bodmer painting. I want to paint it. I feel like I could camp right there next to it, but it's only three o'clock and it's pouring down rain. I feel like I should just keep paddling. Looks like how? Should I have a pair of they don't pack any sweatpants because it's June. But, you know, so goes this is Montana. Wind blows hard here, with some gusts topping 50 miles an hour, and I take shelter with other paddlers in the cabin windbreak at a place called Hole in the Wall. I get warm, paint from the shelter, and set out the following day despite the sustaining winds. All right, so I'm going for it. I've been waiting all day. This hasn't really cleared up much. Big wind gusts, and they're expecting even more later. So my plan is to the right short here with a little bit less uh, white caps and uh, trying to be as safe as possible. This is not fun paddling, it's going to be a lot of work. Sorry, Carl Bodmer, but I'm not going to get to stop and clean a lot of your places. You see the hole in the wall? can barely maintain control of my canoe at times. It takes all of my strength to keep upright. And I pass many iconic rock formations featured in Bodmer's paintings along the way. Despite the frigid, hypothermic weather, I'm in a constant state of awe from all that surrounds me. I'm lucky to be here and figure out paint and sing.
The opportunity comes the following day. The cloud cover lifts, temperatures rise, and the winds retreat. The river feels as though it has been reborn, and I depart the White Cliffs region for that of the Badlands. Sagebrush dots the chalky brown hillsides, and the river takes on the color of earth. What was a formidable gauntlet just 24 hours ago now feels like a lazy, sun-soaked cruise. I will take my time here. I will take my time and paint. What year? Uh, just this past summer. Yeah. So this is episode three. You have to watch episode four to see the rest of the breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite, but it's one of my favorite. But um, yeah, especially on the river, it's my favorite. So you guys, I, I do have a microphone and I'd like to chase down anyone with questions and I hope that you have some awesome questions for Steve. So um, I guess you're in the way, so I'll get you first. Um, Steve, that was awesome. I have so many questions. Um, one though is, did you run out of any certain colors or were there colors that you thought you needed a lot of that you did not in fact, need to use as much. I to the question, yeah, I did run out of some colors. Uh, I'd say like cerulean blue was like always getting refilled because you know for skies, but I, I never actually ran out. Ran out like I could always. I brought way more stuff than I actually needed. I found like that goes for like painting, but also for food. Like I still have like a month's worth of food at after the end of all this and. I could keep painting probably for at least that long too. Um, but I used a lot of yellow ochre also, that kind of surprised me. Yellow ochre and purple um, were the two colors I used a lot for. All right, oh. I'm chasing people okay. down. Okay, I see you Steve over there. Care. There was someone over here too, but I missed you. So if somebody wanted to start paint, doing watercolors on the river, where would you tell them to start? Like what things would a person need? Oh, what do you need to start painting? Just a brush and some paper and like any kind of watercolor paint really will work. Like you don't have to have a fancy set or anything. Um, what I was using on the river, you can get these little travel sets that have caked watercolors in them. And I found those to be really convenient um, over like the kind that come out of tubes. But I like, think like a basic 12 color watercolor set is all you really need. Um, the other things that I had on the river, I mean, I brought an easel, but like you don't really need an easel. And like most of the time I couldn't use it anyway because the wind was blowing too hard. Um, but I like painting off of a, I had like a little board that I would tape my paper to. And I, I like painting off of a board. But uh, yeah, I feel like I would just encourage you not to overthink it and just like, just have fun and really look. That was kind of my prerogative with it because if I wanted to make a photographic looking painting, I would just take photographs and work in the studio. But there's something about watercolor in particular, that I feel like really serves the moment really well because it is like a certain immediacy. And there's also the accidents that occur and like the fluidity of it that like conveys like, I feel like something, something else really nicely. 
somebody over here. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, do you feel like your paintings evolved a certain way over, I mean, painting almost daily for three months? Did you see kind of patterns pop up? And I'm yeah. curious too, if it's kind of affect how it's affected you since then too, as an artist and. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the first part of the question being like, how did things evolve? Yeah, like yeah, I feel like well, they evolved for me trying to get away from the idea of like trying to make it look exactly like what it was, and and evolved in more to just like the immediacy of the moment, um, and so for for me that involved like just limiting myself to like that single brush for the most part. I just used a big round, and uh, I had a a big flat brush too that I would sometimes use to lay down a bunch of color really quickly, but. I think it evolved in that sense and just getting away from like detail oriented brushes because I didn't have time to like get into that kind of detail. And when I did try, I was usually unsatisfied with, with the painting or um, I feel like one thing I love about painting in particular is I'm trying to like surprise myself with each new painting. And um, sometimes like having those limitations are a helpful way to get there. I also thought to one thing that I started evolving in my own kind of way of approaching it too is like trying not to judge the work when I made it because I would end a painting and be like, oh, that's really good. Or the opposite, sometimes I'd be like, oh, that was a dud, you know? And uh, only to like the next day, like look at it with fresh eyes and be like, actually, I really actually like that painting. And then the one that I thought was really cool was like not so cool. So that, that was like another thing that, kind of evolved from it. it I was just trying to loosen up and not become overly formulaic with the work and I, I definitely think there are patterns and it's hard it's especially hard sometimes when you're on the river like your your viewpoint is pretty similar from day to day so it's like how many different times can like that same shape start to take on something so I would try getting closer or climbing up something or um, but mostly is just the pragmatic part of I'm really tired, but I want to make a painting. So this is where I am. Steve, um, do, do you have any paintings that have actual mosquitoes <laughs> stuck to them? Uh, I don't know, actually. I don't think so. And uh, I did bring some paintings. I didn't, I forgot to put them out, but oh, I can, yeah. I can, I have a stack here. If people want to see them, I can, yeah, I can. I don't know if I have any mosquitoes, <laughs> but like you can see them in up close. I mean, they're they're very like um, I haven't like flattened them out or anything. You know, they're just like this was. I mean, this was a windy day, uh, um, but no mosquitoes that I'm aware of. Did you have any like near mishaps um, where you? I mean, did you lose any paintings due to the weather or whatever? You know, weird canoe stuff. I never lost a painting. I did uh, get a lot of water in the boat at one set of rapids below Fort Peck Dam, and that damaged some of the paper that I hadn't yet painted on. But I mean, it's watercolor paper and it's going to get wet anyway. So I tried to not be overly precious about those kind of things, thinking that, you know, the experience itself and is, is part of it. <laughs> so that would, that would probably be the closest call, but like my system was, I'd have like, it was kind of like a big Ziploc bag of sorts that I could keep unused watercolor paper in that wasn't quite watertight. And then finish, finish work. I could sneak behind, um, I had, I did have a watertight like Pelican briefcase that I kept all my camera gear in and I could sneak finish paintings like behind the foam. I could at least get 15 of them in there. And then I would, I would get to like a town and and use the priority mail envelopes to mail the work back to Elizabeth in Kansas City. So that's how I- What did you paint Elizabeth. before this? What do I paint before that? Oh, I, I paint a lot of things. Um, um, bison, grizzly bears, yeah. uh, lots of animals. Uh, I'd say like, there's more of like a, I work from photographs a lot and, and collages. So there's a more of like a photographic realism and kind of tightness to the work that I do in the studio. And that might be watercolor or it could be um, a lot of oils, really what I love to work in. 
Do you teach uh, painting at KCAI? I teach in the foundation department. And so sometimes that includes like painting processes. Like I'll, I'll teach a five week workshop usually each spring that's painting based either in oil or, or watercolor, but I'm kind of doing everything and foundation. We're kind of a hybrid 2d, 3d time-based media all in one course. So painting sometimes part of that. Yes. Hi, Steve. Steve, my name is Matt. I met you near the end of your journey. Um, and I was just curious what your most uh, memorable wow moment was paddling on the river. My most memorable wild moment paddling the whole river. Wow. Wow moment. <laughs> Good wow or bad wow? Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, I should have like a ready answer, but um, I mean, like on the bad wow, I mean, it does stick out to me. Like one of the most memorable nights was in a tent on Lake Sakakawea. There was a severe thunderstorm warning. And so, I mean, the weather was been my biggest fear. And I, I up to that point was really lucky. Uh, I was typically in like a marina or a bar whenever severe weather hit. And I, I don't know why I got lucky on that, but um, this one night there was severe thunder warning. So I, I pitched my tent like a little bit higher up uh, out of the lake area and like the one little flat part. And I just like texted my wife good night because on my little Garmin, you could get satellite texting. And like 30 seconds later, I just hear this like aggressive grunting and snorting sounds like right outside my tent. and. Um, it went on for about 30 minutes. Like uh, it was probably a cow. It could have been a bull, but like the snout was like going into my tent. It'll be in episode seven. Uh, I, I didn't film it, or at least my reaction to it. But that was that was a memorable night. But I remember like the day after that, the stuff like complete opposite, right? Like Lake Sakakawea is still one of my favorite. Uh parts of the journey and um, it was just like brutally hot the next day and I made like really good mileage and then the the following morning the wind started to pick up and I only made it like a mile or so into this little cove and it was just it wasn't too far from a town I think like Skunk Bay is close to it if if anybody ever goes to Lake Sakakawea but I had this cove to like myself and I remember getting out and just the wildflowers were all in bloom and I crawled up and I saw a deer, uh, and, you know, on like this like ridge line. And um, it was just like the perfect place to be stuck. You know, it's like, if I'm going to be stuck, like this is where I want to be. <laughs> and uh, the wind was blowing and I just painted all day and just soaked it in. And it was a great like counterpoint to the previous night, which was one of the scariest nights. I remember. Well, this goes back to teaching. So I was wondering if your experience has changed the way you view your students' work. You know, I, I honestly haven't thought about that as a question, but I'm sure I'm sure it has. I feel like trying to approach what anybody's making, like there's a whole like history and story to that prior to me being like their teacher. Like people aren't like empty vessels that need to be like filled with knowledge that I have, right? Like I want to meet them where they are and help them become their their most creative or at their best. And um, I don't know, that's just like something I've been thinking of recently. And I, I don't know if that if that is part of this journey per se, but um, yeah, I'm sure it, it has impacted the way I, I think about my students. I want to get them off the river if I can. I mean, aside that. Uh, we have a question back here. Uh, that was an awesome presentation. Um, so jealous. Uh, I was also curious, were you able to keep all of that electronic gear alive the whole time and charged? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I mean, like you have your water and your food and your electricity like just trying to keep those supplies at like a comfortable level. And for me, like the electricity part was really important for 
just the documentation. Um, I mean, I, I went in with a lot and I never, I never ran out. I mean, I, I probably had more than I needed though too, but I would like take advantage of any opportunity to like fill up, top off my electricity, just like I would the water. Um, but I also used uh, one of those goal zero solar panels. So I could keep like your phone dies like every day. I mean, basically like I'm keeping the phone charged every day and I had tons of batteries um, for the camera gear. That's why I use a large part of my grant money on was like the tech side of things. So I, I never ran out, but uh, yeah, the goal zero um, solar panel and then the, the battery that I purchased, which was way too expensive, worked out great. So if, if people have questions of like those logistics, I'm happy to, to talk more and tell you what gear um, what gear I, I used at least. And then since I still had the mic, I was going to see where could we follow you to find your uh, episodes when they're released. Thank you for mentioning that because I always forgot. <laughs> I meant to click that. So um, steve-snell.com is my website, and I'll definitely be posting them there. Um, at Steve Snell's Instagram, and I'll be announcing things there. And that's also where you can actually see a lot of photos that I didn't share on this presentation from the journey. I tried to like do like weekly or bi-weekly like updates. And then you can always email me too. And if you're interested in being part of an email list, I don't have, I'm like just now trying to figure out how to do this, but like I can add your email to like a larger email list of just for this project, which will announce when like shows are coming up or when episodes will be released. So just, just email me and I'll, I'll add you on that, on that bigger list of um, places. Cause I know, for example, I'll do a talk in Kansas city come June and then show some of the paintings there with the department of conservation. And then they travel to Jeff city after that to their local department of conservation. And I'm just continually trying to like add um, more, more shows and places to share the work. So Facebook, yeah, I do Facebook as well. And uh, just look for Steve Snell, I guess. And uh, the videos themselves, I didn't put it on there, but YouTube is kind of where I imagine, that's where I, I feel like they belong. Like I really, my goal with this work is to try and reach as many people as I can. And so I'll just start putting them on YouTube because I feel like that's where everybody is or a lot of people I should say are. Steve, uh, I'm still trying to get my head around the couch boat. Yeah. It, it doesn't look like it would float upright. H how did you balance that thing? <laughs> it actually floats perfectly. Wow. Yeah, it glides just like I would ever dream it would. Upright, stable. It's kind of like a stand-up paddleboard actually is the way you you move the thing. And that's a little clunky because you have to get the, the paddle over the back of the couch. Um, but like after a few hours, you get the hang of it and you just kind of go like this back and forth. There's no keel to it. It's styrofoam core with, uh, there are a bunch of, so the, the couch started because I just saw an old rotted styrofoam couch in my friend's backyard. And I was like, that'd make for a great boat. <laughs> And then I found a bunch of two by fours and ripped them up into lattice and like made that like that facade. Um, I still have a couch boat. I use it in my studio as a couch. Uh, but but I have like play, I mean like I feel like it would be actually a reasonable boat to put down in Missouri. I feel like I could actually steer that reasonably well. But I'm I have this other idea for the pretzel boat, which is like kind of on hiatus until I find a better studio. I, I hope the MR340 is in your future. <laughs> it's always been in the back. I did register years ago and then COVID hit and then flooding and all that. So one day. Thank you so much for sharing your adventures with us. And do you have future plans being so young to float down the Mississippi? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a very short answer. I, um, I'm not going to do it for at least 10 years to 10 to 18 years. Um, but one day I do want to float the Mississippi or another river. Like I, I love rivers. I, I feel like there's something so simple yet. Like it's just like ready-made for you. you. You don't have to overthink it. You're on this line 
and every day something is new and it's so beautiful and it's a great I feel like excuse to make art in a way uh, but also just to live and so yes I want to I would love to float the Mississippi River I mean I was just on it for like four or five hours that one day and it really kind of threw me off like after spending three months on the Missouri you really kind of get a feel for things and you feel like you know it and then you hit that confluence and it was really it was kind of unsettling honestly for me I'm like I don't know this river at all and it's pushing me in a way that I don't like and it was actually really it was a lot slower too than I was anticipating it being but um, since talking to other through paddlers I'm, I'm definitely keen to to get on that river one day maybe with my son though when he's older and we can do it together Steve I want to say just um is this on okay perfect um really engaging and impeccable pacing on the episode I mean I was there for it the entire time and I feel like that structure works incredibly well um as a former foundation student of yours um, I was thinking about your absence in sabbatical last semester and how the foundation department was missing such a spectacular teacher. Did you miss teaching during that time? Oh, that's thank you for saying that, Nick. And, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Nick, Nick traveled here from Kansas City for this talk and was a student of mine. Just to give some credit, I mean, like 2019. So we're talking like four years ago. You remember it. You remember me. Thank you for remembering. Um, but did I miss teaching? Uh, do you want my honest? <laughs> I love teaching. I feel called to it for sure. Like I, I love my job. But it was like honestly, like one of the biggest creative gifts for me was to not to not teach this past fall. I feel like that's what one thing I love about my job is I usually have the summer to like get back into my own head. And like creatively, like that's where I can really make up a lot of the work. Um, and so having that extend into the fall um, was just a true gift. I, I got like, I mean, that episode is primarily done back in October. And since I'm now back to full time teaching, like we'll get, I'm kind of waiting for summertime to get to get to episode. I think I'm on episode five right now. So, yeah. And in continuation, thank you for the compliments. Absolutely. In continuation, then I know somebody asked something a bit similar, but are there any experiences that you've um, gained from this monumental journey that you might translate into your courses and classes in the future? Oh, I, I, I've taught an adventure art class before, and it was the hardest class I've ever taught. Um, would I like to bring parts of that back? Absolutely. Um, I'm just thinking like 2013, this is prior to KCAI, me and 13 students hiked 55 miles on the back roads of Nebraska farm roads, tracing the Oregon Trail on a field trip to the Museum of Nebraska Art. I almost faced a mutiny after the first day. This was in the middle of January. And it was like a high of 20 degrees, but we did it. And I feel those students ever see this, they won't ever forget that class. Um, and I won't either. That was my first year teaching. Um, but to like your question, like, would I bring it back? I would love to, to, to do more. I mean, like whatever I can, like, I think like the value of experiential learning and whatever curriculum it might be is just for me at least, like, that's a priority. Um, so, I mean, Steve Schnarr mentioned the Brush Creek Film Festival. That's a class I'll be teaching here in just like three weeks time. And uh, not just making it about like learning film and timing and editing, but like to actually get out there and like discover your creek. I think like challenge students to like, go find the headwaters, Brush Creek. It's under a parking lot somewhere in Kansas. But you, you can find it if you're willing to like take that journey and and really look for it doesn't doesn't necessarily require like three months on the river i think to have that really meaningful like memorable life experience so i hope i can do that for the students like that that's a goal of mine always there's a question in the back i was so impressed with your presentation and the enriching aspect of seeing it visually and watching you go through it with your level-headedness of never getting 
nervous or scared or anything. But what I'm thinking is it would be really valuable for junior high and high school to encourage certain subjects of studying because it really crosses over into many different areas from geography, uh, meteor, you know, um, well, a lot of subjects. <laughs> Nothing's coming up right away. But I think that's so valuable. You could really inspire younger generations. Well, thank so. you. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope to inspire to inspire anybody, really. I mean, like I feel like if I can hopefully appeal to to people with an interest in art or people with an interest in the river or just a random like YouTube search and they somehow find this, but then to like find something else, whether it's the history of the river, the geography of the place, and and gain an appreciation for it, then then I, I'm I'm happy, and I'm learning a lot myself just now, like in hindsight, like trying to to write these episodes. Like I I'm going off of like what I recorded, and I basically have hours and hours of GoPro footage that I'm trying to distill down for like something that makes sense. But then I I'm also realizing how much I didn't know, like when I was going through there and like learning that history kind of in hindsight and then trying to make sure I get it right when I, when I make this. So that's part of the reason for how long it's taking me too. I just feel like an ethical responsibility to like not say a bunch of stuff that's rubbish <laughs> and then put it out there on YouTube for people to think that it's, it's correct. So if you saw, if I said anything, let me know. This is just a draft. So I'm, I'm trying to like make sure I get it right. All right, I I think that's all the questions that folks have. Um, I do want to let everybody know, like we have a, a donation jar in the back, and tonight we'll be giving the donations in that jar to Steve wow. and his family. So um, if you have, uh, we're inspired to to you know he's still got a lot of work to do um, on his project, so you can donate in that blue box there. Um, and of course, Missouri River Relief is also a nonprofit organization. You can always support our work on our website, which is riverrelief.org, um, or you can talk to one of us as well, um, especially Lisa in the back in the black there. Yeah, Lisa would love to talk to you. Um, what an awesome audience. What great questions for Steve. And Steve, thank you for sharing that episode. It's so good. Oh, so you. good. So you you guys all have have a good evening and and follow Steve in all the places and uh, we can't wait to see them come out on YouTube. Thank you for sharing. Thank you all for coming. And I feel like I'm just gonna give all those donations right back to Missouri River Relief because that's that's where it should go. That, I mean they, they've done so much for me. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, should I put? Should I like, tell people? I can just put it over here. Where's your microphone? Is it this one? Yeah. Yeah. Check now. You're still on. Oh, mine's still on. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. You want to keep talking? Oh, I was going to tell people that uh, if they want to see some paintings, uh, I'll put them over there. Step up there where they can see. Check. Can I just do it in this one? Check. Check. All right, can you hear me? Uh, oh, it's okay, you can keep going. I was just gonna say, we're gonna put out some paintings over here if you did wanna see some before you head out. And uh, as far as the donations go, all that should just go back to Missouri River Relief. They've done so much for both me and my students over the years. I just wanted to like really say thank you for Missouri River Relief for all you do. We'll be at the river cleanup in like two weeks time, me and 17 students. So. Isn't table? Just make sure there's no beer out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't have to put this out. Maybe that, that, that's enough to make like, you know, it. Okay. Oh, sorry.